good morning, everyone. Welcome to the workshop Economic Theory and Applications, and organized by our school, FGV PGE, Escola Brasileira de Economia e Finanças. We are very pleased to have you all here today, and we'd like to thank, uh, especially our guests, invited speakers, uh, David Dillenberger, uh, Leonard Bustin, Constantin Milbrak, Paulo Matheson, Pietro Ortoleva, and Elio Herrera. Um, each speaker is going to have like 45 minutes to, to talk, and then you have like 10 minutes Q&A. Uh, this workshop, workshop is being broadcasted, so, but only the audience is allowed to make questions, right? So, Lucas, you... Good morning. Uh, thank you, Umberto. And, and uh, I would like also to uh, thank the, our uh, speakers uh, for this uh, day which i'm sure is going to be wonderful and thank our students for coming and taking and thank you everybody who is watching from home uh, let's start uh, i want to invite uh, paulo monteiro who is going to be the chair of the first session So have 45 minutes, then there are five minutes for questions. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Let me be the first to thank the organizers. I'm sure it will be an amazing uh, day here. So um, today I'm going to talk about a paper joint written with uh, Pietro Toleva, who is here, and uh, Simone Cherea Vioio. Uh, it's called Caution and Reference Effects. Okay, so let me tell you what are we doing. I'll give you the bottom line and then we'll do some details. So there are uh, three main phenomena in behavioral economics. And one of them is the endowment effect, the idea that individuals' um, valuation of the good depends on whether they hold the good or not. Loss aversion, there's people that refer to loss aversion in different ways, but what we think here is a rejection of symmetric bets around zero. And the certainty effect, which is a violation of expected utility in the present of a sure outcome. Now, the leading model in behavioral economics is prospect theory. And prospect theory has two layers. So the first one is there is some asymmetry between gains and losses. So the idea is that losses loom larger than gains. And this will generate both um, endowment effect and loss aversion. And if you want to capture the certainty effect, you add to the mix probability uh, weighting. What we want to do here, we are going to give a new approach uh, to study all these three, uh, three phenomena jointly. They all come from the same source. And their idea would be, the story that we are going to suggest, is that individuals do not know which utility to use. They are basically unsure about their utility function or about the trade-off between goods and they are going to solve this uncertainty with caution in the way that I'm going to make precise. And what we are going to see that this um, approach will allow us to generate all the three effects even if we are going to kind of tie our hands and we'll impose some symmetry again in a way that I will make precise um, later. And then I'm going to argue that this is not just a different, conceptually a different story, but also behaviorally, the two models, like this model is different from known other approaches, in particular prospect theory. There are some um, phenomena that we can explain and they cannot, and vice versa. If time permits, probably there will not be a lot of time. But I will also uh, refer to the um, existing empirical evidence and argue how we can um, address it. Okay, that's the plan. If there is any question, please 
stop me at any time, okay? Excellent. So let me start by, here are the three phenomena uh, of interest that, that we are going to um, discuss. The first one is the certainty effect, which is, start, which is the version of uh, a Le paradox from the 50s. What I'm showing here is known as the common ratio effect. And the idea is the following. Individuals are asked to choose between getting 3,000 for sure or a lottery that give them 4,000, the probability 0.8, and zero otherwise. Then, and many people choose the sure amount, 3,000 for sure. Then the, individu the same individual has to choose between the following two prospects. One of them gives 3,000 with probability quarter and zero otherwise, and the other gives 4,000 with probability 0.2 and zero otherwise. And here individuals switch, switch. They tend to uh, choose D. Now, the choice of A and D, basically what we see is that individual choose a sure outcome, delta X means getting X for sure over a lottery, but when the both prospect is mixed with a common lottery, here it will be zero with probability 0.75, individual switch and choose the mix of the lottery. Why this is known as a Le paradox? Because this is a violation of expected utility or the main axiom in expected utility, which is the independence axiom, that basically say if you choose A over B, you need to choose C over B. Okay, so this is the certainty effect. The endowment effect is a gap between the minimum the individual is willing to accept to give up an object that he owns and the maximum he or she is willing to pay to acquire the same object. So the endowment effect refers to the observation that the willingness to accept always exceeds the willingness to pay. And lastly, the uh, loss aversion, basically uh, the first interpretation of loss aversion due to Markovic in 1952 and also in Kamen and Tversky in 79 was the idea that individuals do not like symmetric bets around zero, so they will prefer to get zero for sure over a 50-50 lottery that give them a dollar or minus a Okay? Now, because um, lack of time, I'm not going to uh, show you how these three phenomena uh, appears in the economic literature, but, you know, basically ideas that underline many, many phenomena. You need to believe me that they are important enough that enough people study them intensively. Another premise for today, oh, I need to say. So this is, um, as I said, the main model in behavioral economic uh, that um, try to address this phenomena is known as cumulative prospect theory. And this is a picture that most of you probably saw. So there is some value function. So individuals have utility that depends on whether we are in the gains domain or in the losses domain relative to some reference point. And the idea is that the utility and the losses domain is steeper than the one in the gain domain. So this is known as losses loom larger than gains. This together, this, um, and very often we assume that there is some kink or point of non-differentiability at zero. This um, explain loss aversion and the endowment effect. They are linked together in this model. And so if you want to capture the certainty effect, you need to add to the mix a uh, probability weight. Okay, so this is the, of the theory that we are going to refer to in the talk. And another uh, model that I want that will be a building block of what we are doing uh, in this paper actually is the previous paper of us a uh, CDO for the name of the author. It's called Cautious Expected Utility. And in that model, uh, we study preferences over monetary lotteries and recall the certainty effect that I just um, introduced earlier. Individuals prefer the sure outcome over a lottery 
and then they switch to a lottery mix with a common lottery over the sure outcome mix with the same lottery. Suppose we want to capture this. So what we did in the other paper is suggested an assumption for negative traffic. Basically, we rule out the opposite. So that's the The sure outcome test is not enough to concentrate the evidence of the then if you mix both with the first common lottery view and take it to the test of the field, then mixture of three will definitely be good. Okay, so the idea again that there's something special about having the sure outcome. So if, if the sure outcome is not good enough, when you, you take this appeal from it, it's definitely not good. Okay, and what we showed in that paper. Okay, so first of all, let's say again. So if we define CTV to be the certainty equivalent of a lottery P using the function V, that is the price such that the value of this price equal to the expected value of the lottery, so to define it as a lottery. Then the result that we show is the following, that the preferences of a money satisfy very basic assumption and negative certainty in this sense. Can be if the binary relation, the preference relation satisfy that, then it can be represented as follows. There is a set of utility functions over money with value, such that the value of each lottery is the following. The individual compute the certainty effect of the lottery with respect to every utility in the set and pick the smallest one. Okay? In expected utility, we have one utility function. Here we have a set of utility functions, and the value of the lottery is the smallest certainty equivalent. And there are two layers here. So individuals have multiple utility or multiple possible evaluations. Okay? And he or she uses caution to select. And again, one way to think about it, I'm giving you, I'm asking you what is your value of a lottery that gives zero with probability half, or thousand with probability half. To say what is the certainty, yes. Yeah. This is the, the chipping representation. Uh, yes, this is the representation. So the theory will say this option is an only if or is a test that's great. Okay? And, um, Yes, so the idea is the following. If you ask your lottery, half, half, thousand, zero, ask what is the certainty equivalent. If you ask me, I would say, well, unclear, definitely below 500, above 200, I would say something between 300 and 400. But when you ask me, okay, so how much would you pay for the lottery? I would say, in that case, 300. So again, I have a range of possible evaluation, but when I need to value, I take the, always the most pessimist or the most cautious interpretation. Okay? So in this model, individuals have, um, it's different from probability weighting in the sense that they take probabilities in face time. Okay, so this was also only, only a preface to what's coming next, and uh, now let's dig into what I'm going to discuss today. Okay? So we're going to have bundles in RK. Think about it as money, mugs, pens. Dimension one will always be money. And since we are interested in a reference effect, our interpretation will be that all will be relative changes with respect to a given reference point. So if Y is the final allocation and R is the reference bundle, then I'm going to view the bundle as the difference y minus r. Okay, so all will be changes relative to the uh, to reference. We're going to have preferences over lottery over bundles. And some notation. So E sub i will be the canonical uh, vector. That means that for any number a, 
AEI will be the vector that gives zero in every dimension but in the i dimension uh, where it gives three. For any function v over bundles, let me define the CPV now to be the monetary equivalent of this lottery. That is, the amount v such that getting z uh, money, z dollars, and zero otherwise, the value of this bundle equal to the expected utility of the lottery. Okay? And sometimes I'm writing delta x, sometimes x, to uh, refer to a lottery that gives the bundle x result. Here we will be our cautious, cautious utility. And you see it's an extension of the previous model. That's why I, I spent some time on remind you or introduce you the previous paper. So now, again, the individual will have a set of increasing and continuous utility functions. They are all normalized, so that V of zero is zero. Zero is here, the getting zero everywhere. This is the reference point. Such that the, cell, the monetary equivalent of this, and preferences are represented as, again, the value of a lottery will be the minimum or the smallest monetary equivalent of a lottery, smallest computed with respect to every utility in the world. Okay? And since um, we would like, our point will be that what will um, uh, drive all the phenomena we're interested in is the aggregation, the the cautious that it uh, come with the um, inf or the mean aggregator, we can think about a different model when we call incautious for the lack of a better name, in which the aggregator rather than the inf you write you take the soup or the mass, and I will refer to it later. Okay, so far so good. Excellent. So let me give you, um, here are the three, again, the, oh, the, the certainty of, uh, effect I already discussed. Let me give you a bit more formally what we mean by the endowment effect in loss aversion. So the willingness to pay is the maximum the individual is willing to pay to get M units of item I. That is, this is the amount such that Staying in the status quo, or in the endowment, or in the reference point, that is getting zero everywhere, it's indifferent to receiving m units in dimension i and paying this amount of money. Okay, the amount WTPIM, call it V, that makes this indifferent, we call it the willingness to pay to get this m units of item. The willingness to accept is the minimum you're willing to um, accept to sell a unit of item. Again, you want to be indifferent between not do anything, which is zero, giving up M units of item I and receiving this amount of dollars. And we say that the preference relation exhibits the endowment effect is for any good eye, the willingness to accept always exceeds the willingness to pay. Okay, this will be our definition, or this is the definition of the endowment effect. Loss aversion, we say that individual is loss averse in dimension I if what? He prefer not to do anything, that is to get zero for sure, over um, participating in a 50-50 lottery which gives him M with, M with probability half or minus M with probability half. Yes, please. How do you play with new-dimensional groups? I mean, you have to just play with some new-dimensional groups, and then say, so you are playing with the new-dimensionality. 
Yes, so one thing that we are interested in is the talk about thing like the endowment effect. The endowment effect is about trade-off between money and money. This is something that we couldn't discuss even in the previous paper. Across the, the, the goods also, you're going to play with that? Or? Absolutely. 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 And you see here that I have EI and E1. It will be actually the key. Okay. Um, okay. Before I'll give you the main result, by the way, I, I try to be not too ambitious. I'm going to give you a result, then we, we work out an example that will be super simple, but it will be very, very ge generic. And if you get this example, I'm happy, okay? That will be the goal of today. Then if there will be some time, I will add some more. But, okay. okay. So as I said earlier, usually this uh, phenomena stemmed, at least in the behavioral literature, from some asymmetry in the utility function. That losses loom larger than gain. Now, we don't have anything, again, uh, asymmetry, but we want to give you a new channel, to suggest a new channel that drive this result. And we want to say that we can do it, that it doesn't rely on asymmetry. That is, even if we want to tie our hand and to impose symmetry in a well-defined sense, and to show that even if we are, must be symmetric, we still gener generate. It all comes from the Caution interpretation rather than a symmetry. Okay? So that's what, that's the, our uh, reason to impose symmetry. So what do we mean? So let me define f bar of, for any function f, f bar of x to be minus f. A function f is odd if f equal to f power. That's the definition of an odd function. I we would say that a set of utilities is odd if whenever f is in the set, so it's a specular function. So a set is odd clearly if all functions are odd. But if there is function that is not odd, is specular is also in the set. In that sense, we are kind of um, build symmetry inside the model. Okay? And symmetric cautious utility will be cautious utility where the set of utilities is on. And again, I want to emphasize we focus on symmetric cautious utility to highlight the role of caution even under a symmetry. Okay? Okay, so that's um, the main result I want to discuss today. And it says the following. If you take a relation, preference relation, that have a symmetric cautious utility representation, then it satisfies the endowment effect and is lossable. If you have incautious utility, which is the opposite, then you are the opposite of the endowment effect, and you are gain symmetry. Okay, so the symmetric cautious utility, we already know, captured the certainty effect. That's also, for this we don't need this paper, this is from our previous paper. What we add here to the mix, that is the exact same, um, exact same idea also leads to this to phenomena even under this. This is not an equivalence result, right? So it's just an implication here, right? So it's not true that A and B hold them and have a symmetric cultural representation for... Oh, of course not, in the sense that um, you can be a cautious, you can be in a multi-prospect theory, in fact. So just say, if you have this, then we have this, we have an equivalent, uh, some axiomatization of the functional form that I'm not going to discuss today. What we say is that this model generates the three phenomena from one source. Yeah? Again, we are not the only, per only model that can get it, but we can. And the key here is that if you take the difference, the incautious utility, you'll get the exact 
So it's all about the portion aggregate. That's the key. Okay? So let me try to illustrate what's going on with a simple example. Um, and the simple example, it's very simple. But the surprising thing that is super, gener super um, generic. If you understand this, you understand the paper. Okay? By the way, how much time do I have? 45 minutes total, but now? Ooh, 25 minutes. We can go to, to see Copacabana and back. Okay, so let's, let's understand this example. Suppose we have two dimensions. Money is first dimension and the second dimension is money. And let me write, and suppose the set W has two utility functions. Let's look at the simplest two utility I can write. Symmetric and linear. So the first one, the value of a bundle x1, x2 is x1 plus x2. And the other is x1 plus 2x2. What does it mean? It means that according to the first utility, one mug, a mug worth one dollar, and according to the other utility, a mug worth two dollars. Okay? Let's calculate together the willingness to pay. This is the amount Z, such that Staying in the reference point, not do anything, which is the bundle zero, zero. The individual is indifferent between that and giving up Z dollar and getting M, M max. Okay? So the value of zero, zero is the minimum, minimum between zero and zero, it's just zero. Now here the utilities are linear, so I don't need to do any inverse to get the search the certainty equivalent. So let's just do that. What is the value of losing Z, giving up Z a dollar and getting a mug? Is the minimum between what? According to the first utility, it is minus Z plus M. According to the second utility, it's minus Z plus 2M. Since you have a cautious utility, you take always the minimum interpretation it will be minus V plus M. That, therefore, I want them to be equivalent, A in different. So zero equal to minus V plus M, which tell us that the willingness to pay for M units of item two is M. So far so good? Let's move to the willingness to accept. This is the number, the amount of money R, such that you are indifferent between zero, zero, and receiving R dollars and giving up the M mug that you have. What is now the value of R minus M? Well, according to the first utility, it is R minus M. According to the second utility is R minus 2M. These are linear utilities, so you just plug the values. I take the minimum one, which is R minus 2M. So therefore, R is the amount such zero, the value of this bundle equal to the value of this bundle, which give us that the willingness to accept is 2M. Hallelujah. What we have? We have that the willingness to accept 2M is greater than M, which is the willingness to pay, which is exactly the endowment effect. So what's going on here? Let's try to kind of feed the intuition. Suppose you are holding the good and you are selling it. The worst thing for you is that you are selling a good thing, like a pitch, right? When you are buying an object, the worst interpretation for you is that you are buying a lemon. Okay? And therefore, you will be willing to pay less when you buy the object. Because the worst is to get a, a, a 
bad quality. When you pay, when you sell, you're afraid that you are giving up something good and you will ask more. And this uncertainty about the trade-off, uncertainty about how much a mug won for you, that generates the endowment. If you understand that, that's the paper. One second. I'm a bit uncertain here. The example where you just give me the interpretation is it's a peach or it's a lemon. But it's all about your utility. It's not about the there's no uncertainty about the good that you're receiving, is that correct? I'm just trying to understand. Like you're perfectly certain what the good is and what the quality of the good is. But you're uncertain about your utility, is that correct? You understand? Utility about you answered about utility, which means you are uncertain about the trade-offs. Exactly. You're How much it work for you? Exactly. You're uncertain about the trade-offs, but you're not uncertain that whatever mug you're getting is a crappy mug or a good mug. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So there's no there's no equivalent to, to an uncertainty about the actual quality of the product. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Yeah. It's all your interpretation of what type. Okay, so very good. So I would like to argue uh, that this is holding much more general. So quick result would say, okay, so what I want to, to say that this example, although it's very simple, it's basically um, the norm rather than the exception. So let me uh, say it a bit more formally. Suppose for each uh, V, again, I have a set of utility function, and for each V in the set, I can compute the willingness to accept and willingness to pay with respect to this V in the set. And you can show that the willingness to accept for good I, basically, the individual calculate the willingness to accept with respect to every utility in the set, it's the maximum A1, and the willingness to pay is the minimum one. Okay? So basically, um, since you're cautious, you pick the opposite, the opposite end of the range. If W is odd, then basically it's the same range. And now you understand there is a range of, of values. The willingness to accept is always the highest. The willingness to pay is always the smallest. And therefore, once we have a range, which is not a point, we get the willingness to accept, that we get the endowment effect in strict way. This is the result. You will have a strict endowment effect as long as there is at least two utility functions in the set that disagree in their willingness to accept or disagree in their willingness to pay. In that sense, as long as the set is not degenerate, we have the endowment effect called this case. Okay, in that sense, the result, uh, the example that I suggested was very general. Okay? In Econ 101, remember, we have indifferent curves. Basically, I can say that, and we can think about the notion of marginal rate of substitution, the endowment effect, if there is a doubt about the margin, marginal rate of substitution between money and goods. Okay? Good. Now, you may ask, how about loss aversion? Note that in the example that they gave, is um, the, both utilities were symmetric, and if you do the com computation, you see that actually there is no loss of it. But that means that in this, in the cautious, in the caution uh, utility model, the endowment effect is decoupled from loss aversion. We can have the endowment effect without loss aversion. We can have loss aversion without the endowment effect. We can have both. In fact, we are going to have strict loss aversion if and only if at least one utility in the set is not symmetric. Okay? 
Now, let me use this opportunity to also give some um, preface to Pietro's talk uh, later today. Why we think this is an interesting um, um, property of the model? Because there is some evidence to remember. We want now to, to relate it to empirical evidence. And one thing is about the relation between loss aversion and the endowment effect. So remember that in um, community post theory, the two are go hand in hand together, they are linked, because it's both come from the first. And therefore they should be correlated. And indeed there is some, evi there is some evidence that they are correlated, but there is also some evidence again. Uh, a lot of recent evidence, Pietro probably will tell us something about it uh, later on. It basically show that when you look at a uh, big population, actually they found lack of correlation between loss aversion and the endowment. So this is something that the model can address. This is something that the cost that um, multi theory cannot accommodate. Okay? And conceptually it's come that are related but they they, they come from two different sources. For the endowment effect, it's come because you have doubts on the marginal resolution between money and the object. Loss aversion, I didn't give you the example because of the lack of time. Uh, it's about kind of doubt about how to aggregate against it. In some way. Okay, let me conclude with a brief remark, and then I will not talk about optimization all this, and then I will just open for uh, questions, okay? So as I said, um, our point is not to say, uh, you know, we're not going to run a horse race between models, but just want to ask you to look at the different way to view phenomena that um, are widely, widely used and uh, well known and to show and to suggest that it, they come from a different uh, view okay rather than asymmetry and probability weighting it comes from the multiple utilities and exercise costs. as I said there are some phenomena so this is more than just being a different story there are also, there is a testable way that, a way to test the difference between the two models. So there are some phenomena that our model allow and give difficulties to other popular models in particular for uh, multiple theory. There is something that's known as the violation of gain loss separability, some stake dependence of non expected utility, for example, a Le paradox with bigger uh, amount of money, but it appears with a small amount of, of money. Preferences for randomization. There are some phenomena that um, prospect theory can accommodate and we cannot. For example, what they call the four-fold pattern. Again, in the details. Um, the most important thing is the following, that these two models are completely um, distinct. So we have a result that says that if you have a preference relation that admits a symmetric cost of utility without redundant utility, that is that all the utilities in the set can be active somewhere, if you have both this representation and multi perfect theory representation, then you boil down to expected utility one utility function which is not neutral and no endowment effect. That is, cumulative prospect theory and cost of utility are fully. I think for today this will be enough. I will be happy to uh, answer I don't know what the time, but I will be able to answer any questions. Lot of time for questions. Even better. Please don't be shy.
Uh, so, how does the explanation of this gap in your model relate to the explanation using the income effect? Very good. So, the income effect, okay, so I would say that we don't have income effect in the model, but the, the way I read the evidence, when people talk about the endowment effect, they basically try to they argue in most of the experiments that it's not because of the endowment effect. And the way to do it, they ask the sellers to give their evaluation, the buyers to give their evaluation, and then people outsiders just to, to say their, um, to call it the chooser. And the chooser just to give their evaluation in a term of income, they are identical to the sellers, but we show that the gap in the sellers is much larger. The, one, the gap between willingness to accept and willingness to pay is much la larger than of the chooser. So I think that there is kind of um, accepted in the, in the uh, experimental or empirical literature that um, the um, uh, income effect is not what driven the phenomena, and we abstract from it. Uh, so to me, this is similar to uh, Max Linus' factor security, but instead of like being uncertain about the probability or searching about the value. Uh, is there some kind of like relation or equivalent that you have a set of value functions, you have a set of priors that set the same? Uh, beautiful. So let me uh, ask you to go back. I, I give you the answer, but before that, I'll say all this uh, answer appeared in the previous paper. Okay? And the, and the, the story is the following. Yes, so he asked whether there is, let me just rephrase, okay, to put everyone on the same, on the same um, place. So he says, look, you have the value of a lottery is the minimum of a set of utility function, and in the world of, of risk, in the world of ambiguity, there is the known model of Lebo and Schmeidler in which the individual have a set of um, beliefs or probabilities and they take the minimum expected utility, right? Okay. So, first of all, the models are um, very related. I would argue that in some well-defined sense, this model is the risk equivalent of maximum expected utility. In, in the way to, we formalize it, and again, we are going back something that we did in the previous paper, you can show that both models can come, can be generated from some cautious completion of incomplete preference relations. Okay? So, what do we mean? It means that you can think about an incomplete relation, that you have a set of evaluation, a set of utility function, and you say that if, um, a lottery P is preferred to lottery Q, if all the utilities in the set prefer P to Q, okay? But now you impose on it cautious um, negative certainty independence, and you show that this generates the mean aggregator. You can do the similar exercise, in fact, not you can do. People did it in 2008, Gilboa, Schmeidler, Macaron, and Marinacci, and show that maximum expected utility can be generated from a similar intuition from a model when you have a set of priors, and one act F is referred to G. Set of what? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand that. What? A set of what? You just said a set of? A set of priors or probabilities such that you prefer an act. It's a, it's a different domain, yes? Act F to act G. If all the pri expected utility with respect to all the priors of F exceed that of G, if you impose something, they call it default to certainty, which is essentially our negative certainty independence, turned out, then you saw that the completion gives you maximum expected utility. So in that sense, this model is the risk analog 
uh, of maximum expected utility under ambiguity, and it's very important to have the certainty equivalent here and not the expected utility. Like the behaviorally, they are similar, but psych like psychologically, they are different in the sense that in one you don't know your prior, in the other you don't know your value. But ca can you like devise an experiment to separate the, the two theories? This is a different domain, right? Mm -hmm. In here, the probabilities are given. Again, these are different models. They live in a different world, right? Mm -hmm. Here, the probabilities are given, so they are there. It's it, it just it's it's a different uh, object. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.